had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. Well, it did always seem so to us, but now, in, in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the Duke he values most. For qualities are so weighed that uh, curiosity and neither can make choice of either's moiety. Is this not your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have softened blush to acknowledge him that now I am braced to do it. I have a son, sir, by order of a law, some year elder than this, who is yet no dearer by my account. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. The king of France. Remember, remember him hereafter as my honorable friend. He hath been out nine years. No way he shall again. The year is coming. Attend the king of France, Gloucester. You shall, my lord. Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Know that we have divided and free our kingdom. In his fast our intent, to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we, unburdened, crawl towards death. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you, shall I say, doth love us the most, that we our largest bounty may extend where nature doth with merit challenge? Our eldest point. Goneril, speak first. Sir, I love you more than word can will the matter, dearer than eyesight, space, and liberty. The auto can be valued, rich or rare, no less with life, with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as child their love or father found. A love that makes breath poor and speech unable. Beyond all manner of so much, I love you. Let shall Cordelia speak, love, and be silent. Of all these vows, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and champagnes rich, with wide-skirted meads and plenteous rivers, we make thee late. To thine and Albany's issue be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest reader, wife of Cornwall? Speak. Sir, I am of the self metal as my sister, and prize me at her worth. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love. Only she comes too short, that I name proclaim myself an enemy to all other loves which the most precious square of sense possesses, and find I am alone felicitate in your dear highness's love. Then poor Cordelia, yet not so, since I am sure my love's more ponderous than my tongue. To thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample third of our fair kingdom, no less in space, validity, and pleasure than conferred on God. Now, our last, and though the least, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. I'm happy that I am. I cannot give my heart to my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond. No more, no less. How, how, Cordelia? Mend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes. Then, my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties as our right fit, obey you, love you, and most honor you. Or have my sister's husbands, if they say they love you all. Happily, when I shall wed, that lover's hand must take my plight, will carry half my love with me, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters, to love my father of all. But goes thy heart with this? Aye, my good lord. So young, so untender? So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth then be thy dower. For here I disclaim all my fraternal care, propinquity and property of blood. And as a stranger to me in my heart, hold this from thee forever. Barbarous Scythian, or he that makes his generation messes to gorge his appetite, shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied, and relieved as thou my sometime daughter. Good my lord. Peace, Albany. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. Hence, and avoid my sight, so be my grave my peace, for here I give her father's heart from her. Call France, who stirs? Cornwall and Albany, with my two daughters dowers, digest this third, let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Ourself, by monthly course, reservation of an hundred knights by you to be sustained shall make our abode with you by due term only we shall retain the name and all the addition to a king the sway revenue execution of the rest beloved sons be yours
Here's France, my noble lord. My lord, we first address toward you. What in the least will you require in present hour of her, or cease your quest of love? When we did love her, we did so. But now her price is fallen. Sir, there she stands. If aught within that little seeming substance, or all of it, with our displeasure feast, and none at all, may fitly like your grace. She's there, and she's yours. For you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you where I hate. Therefore, beseech your gay grace to avert your gaze a more worthier way than on a wretch whom nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge hers. This is most strange, that she, who even but now is your best object, should in this trice of time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favor. Sure, her offense must be of such unnatural degree that monsters it, else your foremost affection fall into taint. Which to believe of her should be a faith that reason without miracles should never plant in me. I yet beseech your majesty, if for I want that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not, since what I well intend I'll do before I speak, that you make known it is no vicious plot, now in this, no unchaste action or dishonored step that hath deprived me of your grace and favor, but even for want of that for which I am richer, a still soliciting eye, and such a tongue that I am glad I have not, though not to have it hath lost me in your life. Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me better. Is it but this, a tardiness in nature, that leaves the, the history unspoke that it intends to do? Fairest Cordelia, that are most rich being poor, most choice forsaken, most loved despised. Be in thy virtues here I seize upon, be it lawful, I take up what's cast away. Not all the dukes of waterish burgundy could buy this unprized precious maid of me. Come, fair Cordelia, bid your sisters farewell. Thou losest here, a better where to find. Thou hast her, France. Let her be thine. For we have no such daughter here, nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore be gone, that our grace, our love, our benison. Bid farewell to your sisters. The jewels of our father, with washed eyes, Cordelia leads you. I know you what you are, and like a sister, and most loath to call your faults as they are. Love well, our father, to your professed bosoms I commit him. But yet, alas, did I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. So farewell to you both. Prescribe not us our duties. Let your study be that to your lord, who has received you at Fortune's own. You have obedience scanted, and well are worth the want that you have wanted. Time shall unfold with my declining eyes, who covers faults at last shame derives. Well may you prosper. Oh, my fair Cordelia. Sister, it is not little, I have to say, of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. That's most certain, and with you, next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is? The observations we have made of it have not been little. He always loved our sister most, and with what poor judgment hath now cast her off appears too grossly. Tis the infirmity of his age. He hath ever but slenderly known himself. The best and soundest of his times hath been but rash. Though he must look from his age to receive not alone the imperfections of long drafted condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring with them. Such unconstant starts are we like to have from him as of as this of Cordelia's banishment. There is further compliment in leave taking between France and him. Pray you let us hit together. If our father carried authority with such disposition as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall further think of it. We must do something, and in the heat. Thou, nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom, and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some twelve or, or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother. Why, bastard? Wherefore base, when my dimensions are as compact, my mind is generous, and my shape as true as honest madam's issue. How brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy? Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund. As to the legitimate, fine word legitimate. Well, my legitimate, 
If this letter speed, and my intention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper, now God stand up for the bastards! Cordelia vanished thus, and France and color parted, and the king gone tonight, prescribed his power, confined to exhibition, all this done upon the gad. Edmund, how now? What news? So please your lordship, none. I so earnestly seek you to put out that letter. What then need of that terrible dispatch of it in your pocket? Nothing has such a need to hide itself. Let's see. I, I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It, it is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read. And for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your or looking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend either to detain or to give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I hope for my brother's justification. He wrote this but as an essay, or as, a, or as a taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times. Keeps our fortune from us till we are too old to relish them. Counts me that this I may speak more. If our father would sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue forever. And live the beloved of your bro brother, Edgar. Conspiracy? Sleep till I wake him, you should enjoy half of his revenue. My son Edgar, had he a hand to write this? A heart and a brain to breed it in? What came this to you? Who brought it? It was not brought me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's? It is his hand, my lord. But I hope his heart is not in the contents. Has he never before sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But... I have heard him oft maintain it to be fit that sons at perfect age and fathers declined, the father should be his award to the son, and the son manage his revenue. Villain. Villain, is there opinion in this letter? My poor villain! Unnatural, detested, brutish villain, worse than brutish. Abominable. Where is he? I, I do not well know, my lord. If it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent, you should run a certain course, where if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, it would make a great gap in your honor and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. I dare pawn down my life for him, that he hath writ this to feel my affection and no other pretense of danger. Cannot be such a monster. To his father, who so entirely and perfectly loved him? Edmunds, seek him out. Wind me into him. I pray you, frame this business after your own wisdom. I would have state myself to be in a due resolution. I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey the business as I shall find means, and acquaint you with all. These late eclipses in the sun and moon pretend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendships falls off, brothers divide. Machinations, hollowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our graves. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. In the noble and true heart, Cordelia, be banished. For offense, honesty, too strange. This is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters the sun, the moon, and the stars, as if we were villains on necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves thieves and treacherous by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced and obedience to planetary influence, and all that we were evil in by a divine thrusting on. I should have been that I am had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Pat, he comes, like the catastrophe of an old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy, with a sigh. Oh. Oh, my brother, what serious contemplation are you in? When saw you my father last? The night gone by? Spake you with him. I two hours together. Parted you in good terms? Found you no displeasure in him by, by word nor countenance? 
None at all. <sighs> Bethink yourself when you may have offended him, and, and that my entreaty forbear his presence until some little time hath qualified the heat of his displeasure, which at this instant so rageth in him that with the mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you have a continent forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower, and, as I say, retire with me to my lodging. From whence I will fitly bring you to hear my lord speak. Pray ye go. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, right, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best. I am no honest man, if there be any good meaning toward you. I have told you what I have seen and heard, but faintly, nothing like the image and the horror of it. Pray you away! Shall I hear from you enough? I do serve for you in this business. A credulous father, and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, on whose foolish honesty my practice is right easy. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit. All with me's meat that I can fashion fit. Did my father strike my gentleman for chiding of his fool? I, madam. By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour, I'll not endure it. His nice garritus and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say, I am sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall be well. The fault of it, I will answer. He's coming, madam, I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please. You and your fellows. I'd have it come to question. If he detaste it, let him to our sister, whose mind and mine, I know, in that are one, not to be overruled, <laughs> idle old man, that still would manage those authorities that he has given away. <laughs> now, by my life, old fools are babes again, which must be used as checks, as flatteries, when they are soon abused. Remember what I have said. Very well, madam. And let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it, no matter. Advise your fellows so. I would breathe from hence occasion. And I shall, that I may speak. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my very course. Prepare for dinner. Dinner. Oh, dinner. Where's my fool, my name? Go you, call my fool hither. You, you, Sarah. Where's my daughter? So please you. What says the fellow there? Call the clock pulled back. Where's my fool? Oh, I think the world's asleep. How now, where's that mongrel? Why came the slave not back to me when I called him? Go you, tell my daughter I would speak with her. Go you, call my fool hither. Oh, you, sir, come you hither, sir. What is my name, sir? You are my lady's father. My lady's father? My lord's name, you dog, you slave. I am none of these, my lord, I beseech your pardon. Come, sir, arise, away. I will teach you differences, away, away. If you will measure your lover's length again, tarry. But away! How now, my pretty knave? How dost thou? Sir, uh, you were best take my coxcomb. Why, boy? Why, for taking one's part that's out of favor. Nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits, thou catch cold shortly. There, take my coxcomb. You have banished two of your daughters, and done a third of blessing against your will. You must needs take my coxcomb. How now, uncle? Would I have two coxcombs and two daughters? Why, my boy? If I gave them all my living, I keep my coxcombs myself. There's mine. Beg another of my daughters. Take heed, sirrah, the whip. Sirrah, I'll teach thee a speech. Do. Mark it, uncle. Have more than thou showest. Speak less than thou knowest. Lend less than thou owest. Ride more than thou goest. Learn more than thou showest. Set less than thou throwest. And thou shalt have more than two tenths to a score. This is nothing, fool. Then tis like the breath of an unfeed lawyer. You give me nothing for it. Can you make no use of nothing, uncle? Why, no, boy. Nothing can be made out of nothing. Prithee, tell me, so much the rent of your land comes to, you will not believe the fool. Dost thou know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet one? No, lad, teach me. Uncle, give me an egg, and I'll give thee two crowns. What two crowns shall they be? Why, after I've cut the egg in the middle, and eat up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. When thou clovest thy crown in the middle, and gavest away both parts, thy boyish thine ass on the back or the dirt. Thou hast little wit in thy bald crown, when thy gave thy gold one away. If I speak like myself in this, let him be whipped that first finds it so. Fools had ne'er less grace in ear, the wise men are grown foppish, and know not how their wits to wear, their manners are so apish. When were you wont to be so full of songs, sirrah? I have used it, uncle, ere since thy maidest thy daughters thy mothers, 
is ever since thou gavest them the rod and puts down thine own breeches. Prithee, Nuncle, keep a schoolmaster that would teach thy fool to lie. I would fain learn to lie. And you lie, sir, or you'll be whipped. I marvel what kin thou and thy daughters are. They'll have me whipped for speaking true. Thou have me whipped for lying. And sometimes I am whipped for holding my peace. I had rather be any kind of a thing than a fool. And yet I would not be thee, Nuncle. Thou hast paired thy wit of both sides and left nothing in the middle. Here comes one of the pairings. And now, daughter, Methinks you are too much of late in the frown. Thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hadst no need to care for her frowning. Now thou art oh without a figure. I am better than thee now. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. Yes, forsooth, I will hold my tongue until your face is but you say nothing. Not only, sir, this you are all licensed fool, but other of your insolent retinue do hourly call and call, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured right. Sir, I have thought, by making it well known unto you, to have found a safer dress. But now grow fearful, by what yourself too late have spoken and done, that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance, which, if you should, the fault would not escape censure. For you know, Nuncle, the hedge bear cut the cuckoo so long that it had his head bit off by its young. So out went the candle, and we were left darkly. Are you our daughter? <laughs> Come, sir, I would you would make use of that good wisdom, whereof I know you are fraught. And put away these dispositions, which of late transform you from what you rightly are. Nay, on an ass know when the cart draws the horse. Whoop! Jug, I love thee. Doth any here know me? This is not Lear. Doth Lear walk thus? Speak thus? Are these his eyes? Either his notion weakens, his discerning is a lethargy. Ha! Waking? Tis not so. Who is it that can tell me who I am? Lear Shadow. Your name, fair gentlewoman? This admiration, sir? is much of the favor of other your friends. I do beseech you to understand my purposes right. You are old and reverend. You should be wise. Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and bold that this our court, infected with their manners, shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and lust make it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself does speak for instant remedy. Be then, desired by her that else will take the thing she begs. A little too disquieted to your train. The remainder that shall still depend to be such men as may be sort your age, that know themselves and you. Tarkness and devils, saddle my horses, call my train together. I will not trouble thee, yet I have left a daughter. You strike my people, and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters. Woe that too late repents. Oh, sir, are you come? Is it your will? Speak, sir. Prepare my horses. In gratitude, thou marble-hearted fiend, more hideous when thou showest thee in a child than in the sea monster. Pray, sir, be patient. The tested kite thou liest. My train are men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know, who, in the most exact regard, support the worship of their name. O most small fault, how ugly didst thou in Cordelia show, which like an engine wrenched my frame of nature from the fixed place, drew from my heart all love, and added to the gall. O oh, Lear, Lear, beat at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. My lord, I am guiltless as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord. Hear, nature, hear, dear goddess, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Away, away! Now, gods that we adore, where comes this? Never reflect yourself to know more of it. But let his disposition give that scope that dotage gives it. What? Fifty of my followers at a clap? Within a fortnight? What's the matter, sir? I'll tell thee. Life and death. I am ashamed that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus, that these hot tears which break for me perforce should make thee worth them. I have another daughter, who I am sure is kind and comfortable. When she shall hear this of thee, her nails shall flay thy wolvish visage. Thou shalt find that I'll resume the shape which thou dost think I have cast off forever. Do you mark that? I cannot be so partial, Goneril, to the great love I bear you. Pray you, content. Oswald, ho! This man hath had good counsel. A hundred knights? Tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred knights. Yes, that on every dream, each buzz, each fancy, each complaint, dislike, he might guard his dotage with their powers, and hold our lives in mercy. Oswald, I say! Well, you may fear too far. <laughs> Safer than trust too far? Let me put away the harms I fear. Not fear still to be taken. I know his heart. What he has uttered, I have writ to my sister. If she sustain him and his hundred knights, when I have showed the unfitness? What now, Oswald, 
Have you written that letter to my sister? Aye, madam. Get you some company in a way horse. Remind her fully of my particular fear. There too, add such reason of your own, as may compact it more. Get you gone and hasten your return. <sighs> no, no, my lord. This milky gentleness and course of yours, though I condemn not, yet under pardon, you are much more task for the want of wisdom than praise for harmful mildness. For far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. Driving the better, off the more as well. Go you before to Gloucester with these letters. Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know than comes from her demand out of this letter. If your diligence be not speedy, we shall be there afore you. I will not sleep, my lord, till I have delivered your letter. Shalt see thy other daughter will use thee kindly, for she's as like this as a crab's like an apple. Yet I can tell what I can tell. What canst tell, boy? She'll taste as like this as a crab does to a crab. Thou canst tell why one's nose stains in the middle one's face. No. Why, to keep one's eyes into the side of one's nose, that what a man can, cannot smell out, he may spy into. I did her wrong. Canst tell why an oyster makes a shell? No. Nor I neither, but I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? To keep his head in, not to give away to his daughters, and leave his horns without a case. I'll forget my nature. So kind a of father. Be my horses ready. Thy asses are gone about them. The reason why the seven stars is no more than seven is a pretty reason. Because they are not eight? Yes, indeed, that was make a good fool. To take it again perforce, monster ingratitude. And thou were my fool, uncle, I'd have thee whipped for being old before thy time. Why is that? Thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Let me not be mad. Not mad, sweet heaven. I would not be mad. Go, boy. Save thee, Kieran. And you, sir, I have been with your father and given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Regan his Duchess will be with him this night. How comes that? Nay, I know not. You have heard the news abroad, the whispered ones. They are but yet ear kissing arguments. Not I. Tell have you, what are they? Have you heard of not liking wars toward the two Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. Well, you will, sir, in time. Fare you well, sir. Duke be here tonight. The better, the, the best. This weaves itself perforce into my business. My father hath set guard to take my brother, and I have one thing of a queasy question, which I must ask. Briefness and fortune work. Brother, a word, descend, brother, I say. My father watches. Oh, sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? He's coming hither now, in the night, in the haste and Regan with him. Have you nothing said upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I'm sure on it, not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw upon you. Seem to defend yourself. Now, now quit you well. Yield, come before my father. Light, oh, here, fly, brother. Torches, torches, so farewell. Some blood drawn on me would beget opinion of my more fierce endeavor. <coughs> I have seen drunkards do more than this in sport. Father, father, stop, stop, no, no help. No, Edmund, where's the villain? Here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress. But where is he? I bleed, sir. Where's the villain, Edmund? Fled this way, sir, when but by no means he Pursue could... him, go after him. By no means what? Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. But then I told him of the revenging gods against parasites did all their thunders bend spoke with how manifold and strong a bond the child was bound to the father. Sir, in fine, seeing how loathly opposite he stood to his unnatural purpose, in fell motion with his prepared sword, he charges home my unprovided body, latched mine arm, but when he saw my best alarmed spirits, bold in the quarrel's right, roused to the encounter, or whether gasped by the noise I made, fell suddenly, fled. Let him fly far. Not in this land shall he remain uncaught found, dispatched, the noble duke, my master, comes tonight. By his authority, I'll proclaim it. That which he finds himself shall deserve our thanks. Bring the murderous coward to the stake, he that conceals him death. When I dissuaded him from his intent, and found him pite to do it with cursed speech, I threatened to discover him. He replied, thou unpossessing bastard. Dost thou think, if I would stand against thee, would the reposal of any trust, virtue, or worth in thee make thy words faith? No, what I should deny is this I would. I, though thou didst produce my very character, I turn it all to thy suggestion, plot, and damned practice. 
strange and fascinated villain. Would he deny his letter? Said he. I never caught him. Hark, right, the Duke's trumpets. I know not why he comes. But all ports all bar. The villain shall not escape. How now, my noble friend? Since I came hither, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short, which can pursue the offender. How dost, my lord? Oh, lady, my old heart is cracked. It's cracked. What, did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named, your Edgar? Oh, lady, shame would have it hid. Was he not companion with the riotous knights that tend upon our father? I know not, madam. Tis too bad, too bad. Yes, madam, he was of that consort. Edmund, I hear you've given your father a childlike office. It was my duty, sir. He did beret his practice and received this wound, uh, trying to apprehend him. Is he pursued? I, my good lord. If he be taken, he shall never more be feared of doing harm. For you, Edwin, whose virtue and obedience doth this instant commend itself, natures of such deep trust we shall need, you we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir, truly, however else. For him I thank your grace. Know not why we came to visit you? Occasions, noble Gloucester, of some ploys, where we must have use of your advice. Our father, he hath writ, so hath our sister. Our dear old friend, lay comforts to your bosom and bestow your needful counsel to our business, which craves the instant use. My lady, your, your, your services are right welcome. Good dawning to thee, friend. Art of this house? Prithee, if thou loves me, tell me. I love thee not. Why, then I care not for thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, beggar, coward, pander, one who I will beat into a clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. Why, what a monstrous fellow art thou, thus to rail on one that's neither known of thee nor knows thee. What a brazen-faced varlet art thou. Draw, you rogue, for though it is night, yet still the moon shines. I'll make a sop of the moonshine if you draw, you vulcanly barber monger, draw. Away, I have nothing to do with thee. Draw, you come with letters against the king. Help, help, murder, help. Strike, you rogue. Stand, rogue, stand. Strike, you meet slate, strike. How now? What's what's the matter? Part. With you, Grimman boy, if you please. Come, I'll flesh ye. Come on, young master. Weapons aren't. What's the matter here? The messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak. I am scarce in breath, my lord. Speak, yet how grew your quarrel? This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I have spared. Thou said, thy unnecessary letter spared, you wagtail? Peace, sir, you beastly knave, are you no reverence? Why art thou angry? That such a slave as this should wear a sword, who wears no honesty. A plague upon thy epileptic visage. Smile you my speeches, as I were a fool? What art thou mad, old fool? How fell you out? Say that. It pleased the king his master very late to strike at me, upon his misconstruction, when he, compact and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, rail, and put upon him such a deal of a man that worthied him. Got praises of the king for him attempting who was self-subdued, and the flushment of this dread exploit drew on me here again. Now these rogues and cowards, but Ajax is their fool. Fetch forth the stocks! Stubborn knave, you beastly braggart, know you no reverence? I, sir, I am too old to learn. Call not your stocks for me, I serve the king on whose employment I was sent to you. You shall do small respect, show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master, stalking his messenger. Fetch forth the stocks, upon mine honor. There, sh there shall you sit till noon. Till noon? Till night, my lord, and all night too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Being his knave, I will. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. His fault is much, and the good king is master. We'll check him for it. Your, your purpose low correction is such as basis and contempt wretches, and for pilferings and such common trespasses, the king must take it ill, that he, so slightly valued in his messenger, should have, have him thus restrained. My sister may receive it much more worse, to have her gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs. Tie up his arms! Come, my good lord, away. I am sorry for thee, friend. Tis the Duke's displeasure, who all the world knows, will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Pray do not, sir. I have watched and traveled hard. Sometime I shall sleep out. The rest I'll whistle. The Duke's to blame for this. It will be ill taken. I heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hall of a tree, 
escape the hunt. No port is free, no place to guard, and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. While I may escape, I'll preserve myself. My face all grime with filth, blank in my loins, enough my hair into knots, and with presented nakedness, outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and president of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike their numb and mortified bare arms with pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary. And with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep coats and mills, some with roaring, roaring voices, some with prayers, enforce their charity. Poor Turley God, poor Tom, well, that's something yet, Edgar. I nothing. It is strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. Hail to thee, noble master. Ha! Makest thou this shame thy pastime? No, my lord, I wear co garters. Where is he that hath so much mistook thy place to set thee here? It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say yea. They durst not do it. They could not do it. Would not do it. Tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage. Resolve me, with all modest haste, which way thou mightst deserve, or they impose this usage coming from us. My lord, when at their home, I did commend your highness letters to them, which presently they read, commanded me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer. And meeting here the other messenger, whose welcome I perceived had poisoned mine, being the very fellow which of late displayed so saucily against your highness, had more man than wit about me, drew. He raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Oh, how this mother swells up toward my heart. Where is this daughter? With the Earl, sir, here within. Follow me not. Stay here. Denied to speak with me. They are sick. They are weary. They have traveled all the night o'er. Mere fetches. The images are of Walton flying off. Fetch me a better answer. Well, dear my lord, you know the fiery quality of the duke, how unremoved and fixed he is in his own course. Fiery? What quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester. I'd speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, I've informed them so. Informed them? Dost thou understand me, man? I, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak. Commands, ten services. Are they informed of this? My breath and blood. Death on my state. Wherefore should he sit here? This act persuades me that this remotion of the duke and her is practice only. Give me my servant forth. Go, bid the duke and his wife come out here and hear me, or I'll at their chamber door beat the drum till it cries sleep to death. I would they have all well betwixt you. Oh me, my heart, my rising heart, but down. Cry to it, uncle, as the cock needed to the eels when she put him in the face to lie. She napped more of the coxcomb for the stick and cried, Down, Wantons, down. Good morrow to you both. I'm glad to see your highness. Regan, I think you are. I know a reason I have to think so. Oh, are you free? Some other time for that. Dear Regan, thy sister's not. Oh, Regan, she hath tied sharp tooth unkindness like a vulture here. I can scarce speak to thee. If thou but knew with how depraved equality, Oh, Regan. I pray you, sir, take patience. I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. If, sir, perchance she have restrained the rights of your followers, tis on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. My curse is on her. Oh, sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of its confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, I pray you that to our sister you do make return. Say you have wronged her, sir. Ask her forgiveness. Do you but mark how this becomes the house? Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. On my knees, I beg that you will vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. Good sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Regan, return with her. She hath abated me of half my train, looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue most serpent-like, upon the very heart. 
All the stored vengeance of heaven fall on her ungrateful top. Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lameness. Oh, the blessed God, so will you wish on me when the rash mood is on? Never, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender heft of nature shall not give thee o'er to unkindness. Tis not in thee to grudge my pleasures, to cut off my train, to bandy hasty words with me, to scant my sizes, in conclusion to oppose the bolt against my coming in. Thou better knowest the offices of nature, bonds of childhood, effects of courtesy, dues of gratitude. Thy half of the kingdom thou hast not forgot, wherein thee I endowed. Good sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? What trumpet's that? I know it, my sister's. This approves her letter that she would soon be here. This is a slave, who e whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her he follows. Out, varlet, in my sight! What means your grace? <sighs> who stalked my servant? Regan, I have good hope thou didst not know aught. Who comes here? Oh, heavens, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if you love old men, if yourselves are old, make it your cause. Send down, take up my part. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard? Oh, Regan, wilt thou take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All is not offense that indiscretion finds, and though it's term so. Oh, sides, you are too tough. Will you yet hold? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir. You, did you? I pray you, father, being weak seems so. If till the expiration of your month, you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me, for I am now from home and out of that provision, which shall be needful for your entertainment. Return with her? And 50 of my men dismissed? Return to her? Allow me rather be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. At your choice, sir. I pray thee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. Thou art still my flesh, my blood, my daughter. Or disease that's in my flesh. Thou art a sore, a boil, an embossed carbuncle in my blood. But I'll not chide thee. I can be patient. I can stay with Regan. I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Return you to my sister, for those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old. And so, but she knows what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir. What, fifty followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? How in one house should many people, under two commands, hold amity? Tis hard, almost impossible. What if I not you, my lord, receive it from, from those which she calls servants, or from mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack ye, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositaries, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What, must I come to you with five and twenty, Regan? Said you so? And speak again, my lord, no more with me. Those wicked creatures yet do look more well favored when others are more wicked. Not being the worst stands in some rank of praise. I'll go with thee. Thy fifty yet doth double her five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty? Ten. Or five. What need one? A reason, not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. You heavens, give me that patience. Patience that I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against me, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, but not women's weapons, water drops stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags, I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall. I will do such things, but there yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep. No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws or ere I'll weep. Oh fool, I shall go mad. Let us withdraw, there'll be a storm. This house is little, the old man and his people cannot be well bestowed. Cause his own blame has put himself in rest and must needs taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. So on my purpose, where's my Lord Gloucester? Followed him forth. He is returned. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? 
He caused a horse, but I will not know whither. It is best to give him way. He leads himself. And like the night comes on and the high winds do sorely ruffle, for many moths about there's scarcely a bush. Oh, sir, to willful men the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors. Shut up your doors, my lord. This is a wild night. My evening counsels well. Come out of the storm. Blow, winds, and crack your cheeks. Rage, blow, you cataracts and hurricanos. Spout till you have drenched our steeples. Drown the cocks. You sulfurous and thought-executing fires. Vaunt couriers to oak-cleaving thunderbolts. Singe my white head. And thou, all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world. Crack nature's mold. All germen spill at once that make in grateful man. O oh, Nuncle, court holy water in a dry house is better than this rainwater out of door. Good Nuncle, in and ask thy daughter's blessing. Here's a night pities neither wise men nor fools. Rumble thy belly full, spit fire, spout rain, nor rain, wind, thunder, fire, my daughters. I tax not you, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you my children. You owe me no subscription. Then let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand. A poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. But yet I call you servile ministers. At will, two pernicious daughters, join your high-engendered battles against a head so old and white as this. Oh, oh, tis foul. He that has a house to put his head in has a good headpiece. No, I will be the pattern of all patience. I will say nothing. Let the great gods that keep this dreadful putter o'er our heads find out their enemies now. I am a man more sinned against than sinning. Gracious, my lord, hard by here is a hovel. Repose you there whilst I to this hard house. My wits begin to turn. Come on, my boy. How dost my boy? Art cold? I am cold myself. Where is the straw, my fellow? Come, your hovel. Poor fool and knave, there's one part in my heart that's sorry yet for thee. He that has and a little tiny wit, with hey ho, the wind and the rain, must make content with his fortune's fit, though the rain it raineth every day. True boy, come, bring us to this hovel. I'll speak a prophecy ere I go. When priests are more in word than matter, when brewers mar their malt with water, when nobles are their tailors' tutors, no heretics burned but wenches' suitors, when every case in law is right, no squire in debt, nor no poor knight, then shall the reign of Albion come to great confusion. Then comes the time, who lives to see it, when going shall be used with feet. This prophecy Merlin shall make, for I live before his time. Like, like that Edmund, I like not this unnatural dealing. When I desired their leave, I might pity him. They took me from the use of my own, my own house, charged me on pain of perpetual displeasure, neither to speak of him and treat him or any way sustain him. Oh, savage and unnatural. Go to, say you nothing. There is division between the dukes, and the worst matter than that, I, were, I have received a letter this night. It is dangerous to be spoken. I have locked the letter in my closet. These injuries the king now bears will be revenged home. There is part of a power already footed. You must incline to the king. I will look him and privily relieve him. Go to and maintain talk with the duke. And my charity of him might not be perceived, if I die for it. The king, my old master, must be relieved. There is some strange thing toward Edmund. Pray you to be careful. This courtesy forbid thee shall the duke instantly know, and of that letter too. This seems a fair deserving, and must draw me that which my father loses, no less than all. The younger rises when the old doth fall. Here is the place, my lord. Good, my lord, enter. The tyranny of the open night's too rough for nature to endure. Let me alone. Good, my lord, enter here. Thou thinks tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin. Filial ingratitude, and such a night to shut me out. Pour on, I'll endure in such a night as this. O oh, Regan, Goneril, your kind old father whose frank heart gave all. Oh. That way madness lies. Let me shun that. No more of that. Good my lord, enter here. Prithee, go in thyself. 
seek thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more, but I'll go in. In, boy, go first. You houseless poverty, nay, get thee in. I'll pray and then I'll sleep. Have, have, have Come on in here, Uncle. Here's a spirit, a spirit, a spirit. He says his name's poor Tom. What art thou that dost grumble there in the straw? Come forth. Wait, foul fiend follows me through the sharp bothorn of cold wind that follows. Wait, go to thy cold bed and warm thee. Didst thou give all to thy two daughters? Art thou come to this? Who gives anything to poor Tom when the foul fiend led through fire and through flame, through whirlpool? Or bog and quagmire. Bless thy five wits. What? Tom's a cold. Have his daughters brought him to this pass? Is it such, is it the nature for discarded fathers to thus have little mercy on their flesh? Judicious punishment. This cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen. Take heed of the fellow king. Obey thy parents. Keep thy word just. Swear not. What have you been? A serving man, proud in heart and mind, that wore gloves in his cap, swore as many oaths as he spake, and broke them in the sweet face of heaven. Wine loved I deeply, dice dearly. Is man no more than this? Consider him well. Thou art the thing itself. Man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Prithee, Nuncle, be contented. Tis a naughty night to swim in. Now a little fire in a wild field is like an old lecher's heart, a small spark when all the rest of his body cold. Look, here comes a walking fire. This is the foul fiend Flibert Tijibit. Begins a curfew, walks to the first cot. How fares your grace? What's he? Who's there? What, what do you there? seek? What are you there? Your names? Poor Tom, that eats the swimming frog, the toad swallows the old rat in the ditch dog, that drinks the green mantle of the standing pool, was whipped from tithing to tithe, punished, stopped and imprisoned. Forced to ride, weapon to wear, but mice and rats and such small deer have been Tom's food for seven long years. Where, my fellow? Peace, smoke, and peace, thou fiend. What, hath your grace no better company? The Prince of Darkness is a gentleman. Moto is his, he's called Mahu. Go on with me. My duty cannot suffer to obey in all your daughter's hard commands. Will their injunction be to bar my doors and let this tyrannous knight take cold hold upon you? Then I venture to come out and seek you out and bring you where both fire and food are ready. First, I would talk with this philosopher. What is the cause of thunder? And portion him once more, go, my lord. His wits begin to unsettle. Canst thou blame him? His daughters seek his death. Thou say if the king grows mad, I'll tell thee, friend, I am almost mad myself. I, the son, now outlawed for my blood. You saw my life, but lately, very late, I loved no friend. No father is, son dear, true to tell thee. I'll cry you mercy, sir. Noble philosopher, your company. Fellow there into the hobble. Keep thee warm. Come, let's all in. This way, my lord. Child rolled into the dark tower came, his word was still. Fie, foam, pump. I smell the blood of a British man. I will have my revenge ere I depart his house. How, my lord, I may be censured, that nature thus gives way to loyalty. Something fears me to think of. I now perceive it wasn't Altogether, your brother's evil disposition that made him seek his death, but rather a provoking merit, set upon by a reprovable badness in himself. How malicious is my fortune, that I must repent to be just! This is the letter he spoke of, of which approves him an intelligent party to the advantages of France. Oh, heavens, that this treason were not, or not I the detector! Go with me to the Duchess. If the matter of this paper be certain, you have mighty business in hand. Whether true or false, it hath made thee Earl of Gloucester. Go, fetch your father, for he may be ready for our apprehension. If I find him comforting the king, it will stuff his suspicion more fully. I will persevere in my course of loyalty, though the conflict be sore between that and my blood. I will lay my trust upon thee, and you shall find a dearer father in my love. Here is better than the open air. Take it, thankfully. I'll piece out the comfort with what addition I can. I'll not be long from you. All the power of his wits have given way to his impatience. The gods reward your kindness. For terror calls me, tells me Nero is an angler in the sea of darkness. Pray, innocent, and beware the foul thing. Come, 
sit thou here, most son of justice, sir. Thou, sapient, sir. Sit you too. Now, you she foxes. Look how he stands and glares. Not so high as a tri metal? Who are the born, Bessie, to me? How do you, sir? Stand you not so amazed? Will you not lie down and rest upon the cushions? I'll see their trial first. Bring in the evidence. Thou, robed man of justice, take thy place. And now, his yoke fellow back to bench by his side. Arraign her first, tis Goneril. I here take my oath before this honorable assembly. She kicked the poor king, her father. Come hither, mistress. Is your name Goneril? She cannot deny it. And here's another, whose warped looks proclaim what store her heart is made on. Stop her there! Arms, arms, sword, fire! Corruption in the place! False justice, or why hast thou let her escape? That's my five blitz. Oh, pity! Sir, where is the patience now that you so often boasted to retain? My tears being to take his part so much, they mar my counterfeiting. Then let them anatomize Regan. See what breeds about her heart. Is there any cause in nature that makes these hard hearts? Now, good my lord, lie here and rest a while. Make no noise, make no noise. Draw the curtains. So, so. Now I'll go to bed at noon. Come to the friend. Where is the king, my master? Here, sir, but trouble him not. His wits are gone. Good friend, I pray thee, take him up in thy arms. I have overheard a death plot of death upon him. There is a letter ready. Lie him on it. Drive towards Dover, friend. Or th there thou shalt meet both welcome and protection. If thou shouldst dally half an hour, all thy lives and his will, sure, will surely be ended. Go on, go on, quick, give thee quick comfort. When we are better seed bearing our rose, we scarcely think our misery is our foes. Who alone suffers, suffers most in the mind, leaving free things and happy shows behind. But then the mind which sufferings doth or skip, when grief hath mates and bearing fellowship. How light and horrible my pain seems now, when that which makes me bend makes the king bow. He chatted as I father, Tom away, mark the high noises, I self be ready. Lurk, lurk. Most speed of me to my lord, your husband. Show him this letter. The army of France is landed. Seek out the traitor Gloucester. Hang him instantly. Pluck out his eyes. Leave him to my displeasure. Edmund, keep you our sister company. The revenges we are bound to take upon your traitor's father are not fit for you to hold it. Farewell, dear sister. Farewell, my lord of Gloucester. How oh, now? Where's the king? My lord of Gloucester hath conveyed him hence, who, with some other of the lord's dependents, are gone toward Dover, where they boast to have well-armed friends. Get horses for your mistress. Farewell, sweet lord, as you say. Edmund, farewell. Go, seek the traitor Gloucester, hitting him like a thief. Bring him before us. Though well, we may not pass upon his life without the form of justice. Yet our power should do a courtesy to our wrath, which men may blame but not control. Who's there? The traitor? Ingrateful fox, tis he. Bind fast his corky arms. What means your graces? Do my friends do consider that you are my guests? Do me no foul play, friends. Find him, I say. Hard, hard, oh filthy traitor. A merciful lady as you are, I'm none. To this chair, bind him. Kill it, not shall find. What a kind gods, tis most ignobly done. So white, and such a traitor. Funny lady, I am your host. With robber's hands, my hospitable favors, you should not ruffle this. What will you do? Come, sir. What letters have you late from France? What confederacy have you with the traitors who late footed in the kingdom? To whose hands have you sent the lunatic king? Speak! I have a letter guessingly sent down, from which came from a neutral heart, not from one opposed. Cunning. And false. Where did you send the king? To Dover. Wherefore to Dover? Wast thou not charged at peril? I am tied to the stake, and I must stand the course. Wherefore to Dover, sir? Because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes, nor thy Fear sister in his anointed flesh to boorish fangs. The sea, with such a form as his bare head, and cow black night endured, that have buoyed up and quenched the stale fires. Yet, poor old heart, you hope the heavens to reign. If walls had at thy gate that stern time, thou shouldst have said, Good porter, turn the key. All cruel as else subscribed. I shall see the winged vengeance overtake such children. See, thou shalt never. Fellows, hold the chair. In these eyes, I not set my foot. He that will he that will think to live till he be old. Give me some help. Oh cruel. Oh you gods. One side will mock another, the other two. 
But bind your hand, my lord, bind your hand, for I have served you since I was a child. But better service have I never done you now than to bid you hold. How now, you dog? If I, if you were to wear a beard upon your chin, I would shake it on this quarrel. What do you mean? My villain. Come on, then, and take the chance of anger. Has it stand up thus? My lord, you have one eye to see some mischief on them. Oh! Let's it see more. Prevent it. Our vile jelly. Where is thy luster now? A little dark and comfortless. Where is my son Hippon? Hippon, you can know the sparks of nature to quit this horrid act. Out, treacherous villain! Thou callest not he that hates thee. It was he that made the overture of your thy treasons to us, who is too good to pity thee. Oh, my follies. And Edgar is abused. I can't forgive me that. And trust for him. Go, thrust him out of the gate, and let him smell his way to Dover. How is it, my lord? How look you? I have received a hurt. Follow me, lady. Turn out that eyeless villain, throw this slave of home in Dunghill. Break it, I bleed apace. Untimely comes this hurt. Give me your hand. Yet better thus than known to be condemned, than still condemned and flattered. Welcome then, thou unsubstantial heir that I embrace. The wretch that thou hast blown into the worst knows nothing to thy blasts. But who comes here, my father poorly led? World, world, oh world, that thy strange mutations make us hate thee. Life would not yield to age. My good lord, I have been your tenant and your father's tenant these fourscore years. Away, get thee away, good friend. Be gone. Thy comforts can do me no good at all. Thee they may hurt. You cannot see your way. I have no way, and therefore no eyes. I stumbled when I saw. Pull off to steen our, our means can secure us. Our mere defects prove our commodities. Oh dear son Edgar, might I live to see thee in my touch? I say I had eyes again. How now? Who's there? Tis but poor mad Tom. Fellow, where goest? Worse than it yet. The worst is not so long as we can say, This is the worst. Uh, is it a beggar man? In the last night's storm, I, I such a fellow saw. Should me think a man or worm? My son came then into my mind, and yet my mind was in scarce friends with him. I have heard more since, as flies swant boys are we to the gods, kill us for their sport. How should this be? But is the trade that must play? Fool to sorrow, angering itself and others. Bless thee, master. Is that the fellow? I am my good lord. I'm afraid to get thee away. If for my sake thou will overtake a hint a mile or twain, and the way toward Dover, do a franks in love, and bring some covering for this naked soul. Shall not treat to leave me? Alack, sir, he's he's but mad. Is the time's plague when mad men lead the blind. Do as I bid thee, or, or rather do thy pleasure above the rest. Be gone. I'll bring the best peril I have. Come on it what will. Sirrah, fellow. Poor Thomas is cold. Come hither, fellow. Knowest thou the way to Dover? Low style and gate, horseway and footpath. Poor Tom hath been scared out of his good wits. Bless thee, good man's son, from the foul fiend. Th thou whom the heavens plagues have humbled to all strokes. But I'm wretched makes thee the happier. Heavens deal so still. Dost thou know Dover? I must. Sir. There is a cliff, whose hind and bending head looks fearfully in the combined deep. Bring me but to the very brim of it. For that place I shall no leading need. Give me your arm. Poor Tom shall lead thee. Welcome. I marvel where my old husband not met us on the way. What? Where is my husband? Madam, within, but never man so changed. I told him of the army that was landed. He smiled at it. I told him you were coming. His answer was the worse. Of Gloucester's treachery and the loyal service of his son, when I informed him, he called me sot and told me I'd turned the wrong side out. What most you should dislike seems pleasant to him, what like offensive. Then tell you go no further. It is the cowish terror of his spirit that dare talk. Not Edmund, to my brother. Hasten his masters and conduct his powers. 
I must change names at home, and give the staff into my husband's hands. This trusty servant will pass between us. Ere long you are like to hear, if you dare venture on your own behalf. Wear this, fair speech, decline your head. This, if it dare speak, would lift thy spirits into the air, conceive and fare thee well. Yours in the ranks of death. Oh, my most dear Gloucester. Oh, the difference in man and man. Madam, here comes my lord. Oh, Goneril, you are not worth that dust which the rude wind blows in your face. Wisdom and goodness to the vile seem vile. What have you done? Tigers, not daughters. What have you performed? A father and a gracious aged man have you matted. Can my good brother suffer you to do it? A man, a prince, by him so benefited. Milk-livered man, where's thy drum? Fresh red hits ours in this our noiseless land, whilst the plumed helms in your state threat? What's thou, oh, old fool, sit still and Christ, alack, why does he so? Say thyself, thou! Proverbs of foreign thee seems not in the theme, so horrid as a woman. A vain fool! What news? Oh, my good lord, the Duke of Cornwall is dead, slain, slain by a servant, going to put out the other eye of Gloucester. Gloucester's eyes? A servant that he bred, thrilled with the remorse, opposed against the act, bending his sword to his great master, who, thereat enraged, flew on him, and amongst him fell him dead but not without that harmful stroke, which since hath plucked him after. This shows you are above, you justicers, that these are another crime so speedily convenged. Oh, poor Gloucester. Lost he his other eye? Both, both, my lord. Madam, this letter craves a speedy recovery. Tis from your sister. One way I like this well, but being widow, and my Gloucester with her, may all the buildings in my fam fancy pluck upon my hateful life. I'll read and answer. Where was the son when they did take his eye? Knows he the wickedness? My good lord, twas he informed against him. Quit the house on purpose, that their punishment might have the freer course. Gloucester, I live to thank thee for the love thou did show us the king, and to revenge thine eyes. Come hither, friend. Tell me what more thou knowest. Alack, tis he. Why, he was met even now as mad as the vexed sea, singing aloud. A century send forth, search every acre in the high grown field, and bring him to our eye. What can man's wisdom in the restoring his bereaved sense? He that helps him take all my outward worth. There is means, madam. Our foster nurse of nature is in prose, the which he lacks, but to provoke in him are many simples operatives, whose power will close the eye of anguish. Oh, blessed secrets, all you unpublished virtues of the earth, spring with thy tears. Be aiding and remediate in the good man's distress. Seek, seek for him. Let his ungoverned rage dissolve the life that wants the means to lead it. News, madam. The British powers are marching hitherward. Tis known before. Our preparation stands in expectation of them. Oh, dear father, it is thy business that I know about. Therefore, great France, my mourning and important tears have pitied. No blown ambition doth our arms incite, but love, dear love, in our aged father's right. Soon may I hear and see him. But are my brother's powers set forth? I not. Himself in person there. Madam, with much ado, your sister is the better soldier. Lord Edmund spake not with your lord at home? No, madam. Or might want my sister's letter to him? I know not, lady. Faith, he is posted hence on serious matter. It was great ignorance, Gloucester's eyes being out, to let him live. Where he arrives, he moves all hearts against us. Edmund, I think, is gone in pity of his misery to dispatch his knighted life, moreover to describe the strength of the enemy. I must eat down for him, madam, with my letter. Our troops set forth tomorrow. Stay with us. The ways are dangerous. I may not, madam. My lady charged my duty in this business. Why should she write to Edmund? Might not you transport her purposes by word? We like some things. I know not what. I'll love thee much. Let me unseal the letter. Madam, I had rather... I know your lady does not love her husband. And at her late being here, she gave strange oilids and was speaking looks to noble Edmund. I know you are of her bosom. I, madam? I speak in understanding. You are. I know it. Therefore, I do advise you take this note. My lord is dead. Edmund and I have talked. And more convenient is he for my hand than for your lady's. You may gather more. If you do find him, pray you give him this. And when your mistress hears as much from you, pray desire her call her wisdom to her. And so farewell. 
If you do chance to hear of that blind traitor, preferment falls on him that cuts him off. Would I could meet him, madam. I should show what party I do follow. Fare thee well. When shall I come to the top of that same hill? You do climb up and now. Look how we labor. He thinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. Hark, do you hear the sea? No, truly. Why then, your other sense has grown perfect by your eyes' anguish. So may it be indeed. He thinks that my, thy voice is altered, and thou speak some better phrase and matter than thou didst. You're much deceived, and nothing might change but in my garments. He thinks they're better spoken. Come on, sir, he's a place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy does the cast one's eyes so low. Men that walk upon the beach appear like mice. The murmuring surge of the un of the sea on the unnumbered pebbles is chafes. Cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more, lest my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Send me where you stand. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. For all beneath the moon would I not leap upright. Let go my hand. Dear friend, fairies and gods prosper. Go, go that farther off. Bid me a farewell. Let me hear thee going. Very well, good sir. Oh, you mighty gods. The world I do renounce, and in your sights, shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great imposeless wills, my snuff and loath part of nature should burn itself out. If Edgar live, well, bless him. Now, fellow, fare thee well. Go on, sir. Very well. Alive or dead? Oh, you, sir, friend, hear you. Speak. This might pass indeed. Yet he revives. What are you, sir? Away and let me die. Ten mass at each, my God, the perpendicular. Bell, oops, the bell has fallen. My life is a miracle. Speak yet again. But have I fallen in or no? From the dread summit of this chalky morn. Look up a height. The oh. shrill gorg lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Do but look up. Oh, like I have no eyes. Give me your arm. Up so. How is it? How are your legs? Too well. Too well. This is above all strangeness. On the crown of the cliff, what thing was that that departed from you? A poor, unfortunate beggar. Therefore, thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who make them honors of men's possibilities have preserved thee. I do remember now. Henceforth, I'll bear affliction until it cry out itself, enough, enough, and die. Bear free and patient thoughts. But who comes here? No. They cannot touch me for coining. I am the king himself. Oh, that was side piercing sight. Nature is above art in that respect. There's your press money. That fellow handles his bow like a crow keeper. Draw me a clothier's yard. Look, look, a mouse. Peace, peace, this piece of toasted cheese will do it. There's my gauntlet. I'll swear it on a giant. Bring up the brown bills. Oh, well flown bird. In the clout, in the clout. Hugh, give the word. Sweet Marjoram. Pass. I know that voice. Ha! Got her all with a white beard. They flattered me like a dog and told me I had white hairs in my beard ere the black ones were there. Say I and no to everything I said I and no to was no good divinity. When the rain came to wet me once and the wind to make me chatter, when the thunder would not peace at my bidding, there I found him. There I smelt him out. Go to. They are not men of their words. They told me I was everything. Tis a lie. The trick of that voice I do well remember. It's not the king. Aye, every inch a king. And I do stare, see how the subject quakes. I pardon that man's life. What was thy cause? Give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary, to sweeten my imagination. There's your money. Let me kiss that hand. Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. A ruined piece of nature. This great world shall so wear out to not. Dost thou know me? I know thine eyes well enough. Dost thou squint at me, blind Cupid? No, do thy worst. I'll not love. Read thou this challenge, mark but the penning of it. For all the letters, sons, I could not see one. 
I would not take this from Fort. It is, in my heart, break at it. Take that of me, my friend, who has the power to seal the accuser's lips. Get thee glass eyes, like a scurvy politician seen to see the things thou dost not. Now, 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 pull off my boots. Harder, harder so. Oh, matter and impertinently mixed reason and madness. Thou wilt weep my fortunes. Take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Thou must be patient. We came crying hither. Thou knowest, the first time that we smell the air, we wall and cry. I will preach to thee. Mark. Oh, lack, lack the day. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. This is a good block. It were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt. I'll put it in a proof. And when I have stolen upon these son-in-laws, then kill, 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 kill. Here he is, lay hand upon him. Sir, your most dear daughter. No rescue? What, a prisoner? I am even the natural fool of fortune. Use me well, you shall have ransom. Give me surgeons, I am cut to the brains. You shall have anything. No seconds? All myself? Why, this were enough to make a man a man of salt, to use his eyes for garden water pots, I and for laying autumn's dust. I will die bravely, like a smug bridegroom. What? I will be jovial. Come, come. I am a king, you masters, know you that. You are a royal one, and we obey you. And there's life in it. Come, and you get it. You shall get it by running. Sight most pitiful in the meanest wretch, past speaking of in a king. Thou hast one daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. Hail, gentle sir. Sir, speed you. What's your will? Do you, hear, do you hear aught of a battle toward? Most sure and vulgar. Everyone hears that which can distinguish sound. How near is the other army? Near, and on speedy foot. The main descry stands on the hour of the call. Thank you, sir. That's all. Though that the queen on special cause is here, her army is made gone. I thank you, sir. Give her gentle gods. Take my breath from me. Let not my worst spirit tempt me again to die before you please. Well, pray you, Father. Ah, oh, good sir. What are you? The most poor man, made tame with fame, fortune's blows, who by the art of known and feeling sorrows, and pregnant to give pity. Give me your hand. I'll lead you some disembodied. Hearty thanks. The bounty and the venison of heaven to boot and boot. A proclaimed prize, most happy. That eyeless head of thine was first framed flesh to raise my fortunes. Thou old unhappy traitor, briefly thyself remember. The sword is out that must destroy thee. Now let thy friend hand uh, put strength enough to it. Wherefore, bold peasant, darest thou support a published traitor? Hence, lest that the infection of his fortunes take like hold on thee, like go his arm. Why well, not let go there without further occasion? Let go, slave, or thou diest. Nay, come not near the old man. Keep out, I warn you. Or I'll find whether your skull and my stick be the harder. I'll be playing with you. Out, dunghill. I'll knock your teeth. Come, no matter for your sword. <sighs> slave, thou hast slain me. Villain, take my purse. If ever thou wilt thrive, bury my body. And bring the letters which thou findest about me to Edmund, Earl of Gloucester. Seek him out upon the British party. Oh, untimely death. I know thee well, serviceable villain, as duties to the vices thy mistress, as badness would desire. What, is he dead? Sit you down, father, rest you. Let's see these pockets. The letters that he speaks of may be my friends. He's dead. I am only sorry he had no other deathsman. Let us see. Let our reciprocal vows be remembered. We may have many opportunities to cut them off. For if your will want not, time and place will be fruitly, fruitfully offered. Your wise, so I would say, affectionate servant, Donwell. Oh, indistinguished space of woman's will! Plot upon her virtuous husband's life, and he exchanged my brother? Here in the sands, they all rake up their posts unsanctified. Of murderous lechers. And in the mature time, with this ungracious paper, strike the sight of the death-practiced duke. For him tis well that of thy death and business I can tell. The king is mad. How stiff is my vile sense that I stand up and have the genius feeling of my huge sorrows. Better I were distract. So should my thoughts be severed from my griefs. 
and woes by wrong imagination lose the knowledge of themselves. Give me your hand. Methinks I hear the drum far off. Come, Father, I will study you with a friend. O oh, thou good fool, how shall I live and work to match thy goodness? My life will be too short, and every measure fail me. To be acknowledged, madam, is or paid. All my reports go with thee, honest truth. Nor more, nor clipped, but so. How does the king? So please your majesty that we should wake the king. He hath slept long. Be governed by your knowledge, and proceed in the sway of your own will. Is he arrayed? Ay, madam. In the heaviness of sleep, we put fresh garments on him. Be by, good madam, when we do wake him. I doubt not of his temperance. Very well. Draw you near. Sound the music there. Oh, my dear father, frustration hang thy medicine upon my lips, and let these words repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. He wakes. Speak to him. To you, madam, tis fittest. How goes my royal lord? How fares your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald. Sir, do you know me? Where have I been? Where am I? There are daylight, I am mightily abused. I should even die with pity to see another thus. I know not what to say. I will not swear these are my hands. Let's see. I feel this pinprick. Would I were assured of my condition. Oh, look upon me, sir, and hold your hands in benediction on me. No, sir, you must not, you know. Pray, do not mock me. For I am a very foolish, fond old man. Four score and upward, not an hour more, nor less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. I think that I should know you, yet I am mainly ignorant of what place this is, and all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor do I know where I did lodge last night. Pray do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my daughter Cordelia. So I am, I am. I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I remember, done me wrong. You have some cause, they have not. No cause, no cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Will it please your highness to walk? You must bear with me now. Pray, forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. Our sister's man is certainly miscarried? Tis to be doubted, madam. Now, sweet lord, you know the goodness I intend upon thee. Tell me but truly, but then speak the truth. Do you not love my sister? No, by, by mine honor, madam. I never shall endure her, dear my lord. Be not familiar with her. Fear not, she and the duke, her husband. I'd rather lose the battle than that sister should lose him and me. Our very loving sister, well be met. Sir, this I heard. The king has come to his daughter, along with others from the rigor of our state, forced to cry out. Why is this reasoned? Combine together against the enemy. For these domestic and particular quarrels are not the question here. Let's then determine within the ancient of war on our proceeding. I shall attend you presently at your tent. Sister, you'll go with us? No. Tis most convenient. Pray you, go with us. Oh, ho, oh, I know the riddle. I will go. If e'er your grace had, had speech with men so poor, hear me one word. I'll overtake you, speak. Before you fight the battle, open this letter. If you have victory, let the trumpet sound, and for him who brought it. Wretched though I seem, I, I can't produce a champion that will prove what is vouched here. If thou must carry, your business of the world has so an end, and machination ceases. Fortune loves you. Stay till I have read the letter. I was forbidden. When the time comes that the heralds cry, and I will appear again, while I fare thee well, I will overlook thy paper. The enemies in view, throw up your powers. Here is the guest of their true strength and forces by diligent discovery, but your haste is now urged on you. We will greet the time. To both these sisters have I pledged my love, each jealous of the other, as the stone are of the adder. Which of them shall I take? One, both, neither. To take the widow exasperates, makes mad her sister Goneril. And hardly shall I carry out my side, her husband being alive. 
Now then, we'll use his countenance for the battle. And let her who would be rid of him devise his speedy taking off. As for the mercy which he intends to leer into Cordelia, battle done, and they within our power shall never see his pardon. My state stands on me to defend, not to debate. Dear foe, take the shadow of this tree, dear good host. Pray that the right may thrive. If ever I return to you again, I'll bring you comfort. Grace go with you, sir. Give me thy hand. Get up, father. The king there is lost, and him and his daughters have been captured. Come on, away. Some officers, take them away. Good guard their, until their greater displeasures first be known that are to censure them. We are not the first who with best meaning have incurred the worst. For thee, oppressed king, I am cast down. Myself have not sought frown upon fortune's frown. Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters? No, 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 no. Come, let's away to prison. We two alone shall sing like birds in a cage. And when thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask thee forgiveness. And so we'll live and pray and sing and laugh at gilded butterflies, and we'll wear away in a walled prison, packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Take them away. Come hither, Captain. Hark. Take thou this note. Go follow them to prison. Know thou this, that men are as the time is. To be tender-minded does not become a sword. Thy great employment will not bear question. Either say thou'lt do it, or thrive by other means. I will do it, my lord. About it, and right happy when the haste has done. Mark, I say instantly, and carry it so. Sir, you have showed today your valiant train, and fortune led you well. You have the captives who are the opposites of this day's strife. I do require them of you, so to use them, as we may find that their merit and our safety may equally determine. Sir, I thought it fit to send the old and miserable king to some retention, and appointed guard. With him I sent the queen. My reason, all the same. And they are ready tomorrow, or at further space, to appear where you shall hold your session. The question of Cordelia and her father requires a fitter place. Sir, by your patience, I hold you but a subject of this war, not as a brother. That says we list to grace, and methinks our pleasure might have been demanded ere you had spoke so far. He led our armies, bore the commission of my place in person, the which immediacy might well stand up and call himself your brother. Not so hot. In his own glory he doth exalt himself, more than in your addition. In my rights, by me invested, he compares the best. That were the most, if he's your husband. Jesters do oft prove prophets. <laughs> ah, the eye that looks upon is more than but a squint. Lady, I am not well, else I should answer from a full flowing stomach. Let the drum strike, and prove my title thine. Stay yet, fear reason. Edmund, I arrest thee on capital treason, and in thine arrest, this gilded serpent. For your claim, fair sister, I bar in the interest of my wife. Tis she is some contracted to this floor, and I, her husband, contradict your bands. If you will marry, make your loves to me, my lady is bespoke. <laughs> An interlude! Thou art armed, Gloucester. Let the trumpet sound. If none appear to prove upon thy person, thy heinous, manifest in many treasons, there is my pledge. I'll make it on thy heart. Ere I taste bread, thou art nothing less than I have here proclaimed. Sick! Oh, sick! It's not all nerves, Miss Medicine. There's my exchange. What in the world he is that names me traitor? Villain-like he lies. I will maintain my truth and honor firmly. A herald ho. My sickness grows upon me. I must return to my tent. Come hither, ere let the trumpet sound and read out this. Sound trumpet. <laughs> If any man of quality or degree within the lists of the army will maintain upon Edmund, supposed Earl of Gloucester, that he is a manifold traitor, let him appear by the third sound of the trumpet. He is bold in his defense. Sound! Again! Again! What are you? Your name? Your quality? And why you answer this present summons? No, my name is Lost. But I'm as noble as the man I seek. Who answers for Edmund, the Earl of Gloucester? Himself. What sayest thou to him? 
withdraw. Thou art a traitor to thy gods, thy brother, and thy father. Save him, save him. Tis mere practice, Gloucester. By the laws of arms, you are not bound to answer an unknown opposite. You are not vanquished, but cousin to Beguile. Shut your mouth, dame. With this paper, I shall stop it. Hold, sir. Thou worse than any name. Read thine own evil. Say if I do, the law is mine, not thine. Who can arrange me for it? Most monstrous. Knowest thou this paper? Ask me not what I knowest. Go after her. She's desperate. Govern her. What you have charged me with, that have I done, and more, much more. The time will bring it out. Tis past, and so am I. But what art thou that hast this fortune on me? If thou art noble, I do forgive thee. Let's exchange charity. I am no less blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou hast wronged me. My name is Edgar, and thy father's son. The gods are just, and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. The dark and vicious place where thee got cost him his eyes. Thou hast spoken right. Tis true. The wheel is come full circle. I am here. You thought thy very gate did prophesy a rule of nobleness. I must embrace thee. Let sorrow split my heart if ever I did hate thee or thy father. Worthy prince, I know it. Where have you hid yourself? How have you known the miseries of your father? By nursing them, my lord, list a brief tale, that I my father with his bleeding rings, their precious stones new lost. They came as God, led him, begged for him, saved him from despair. Never, how fall, read him slip myself unto him until some half hour passed when I was armed. Not sure, though, hoping of this good success, I asked his blessing, and from first to last told him my pilgrimage. But his flawed heart and alack, too weak the conflict to support, twixt two extremes of passion, joy, and grief, burst mine in me. This speech of yours has moved me, and shall, perchance, do good. But speak you on. You look as you had something more to say. If there be more, more woeful, hold it in. For I am almost ready to dissolve hearing of this. But who was this? Help! 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 What kind of help? Speak, man. What it means this bloody knife? It is hot. It smokes. It comes from the heart of... She's dead. Who dead? Speak, man. Your lady, sir, your lady. And her sister by her is poison. She hath confessed it. I was contracted to them both, and three now marry in an instant. Produce their bodies, be they dead or alive. This judgment of the heavens that makes us tremble touches us not with pity. Oh, is this he? The time will not allow the compliment which very manners urges. Great thing I must forgot. Speak, Edmund, where's the king, and where's Cordelia? Yet Edmund was beloved. One, the other, poisoned for my sake, and after slew herself. Even so, cover their faces. I pant for life, some good I mean to do, despite of mine own nature. Quickly send, be brief in it, to the castle, for my writ is on the life of Lear and on Cordelia. Nay, send in time. Run, run, oh run. Do, my lord, who is the office? Send thy token of reprieve. Well thought. Take my sword. Give it thee, Captain. Hasty for thy life. He hath commissioned from thy wife and me to hang Cordelia in the prison, and to lay the blame upon her own despair, that she forbid herself. The gods defend her. Bear him hence a while. How, 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 how? Oh, you are men of stone. Had I your tongues and eyes. I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is, one is dead and when one lives. She's dead as earth. Oh, my good master. Prithee away. Is the noble fool, your friend. A plague on you. Murderers, traitors all. I might have saved her, but now she's gone forever. Cordelia, Cordelia, stay a little. I am old now. And these same crosses spoil me. Mine eyes are not of the best, I'll tell you straight. This is a dull sight. Are you not my fool? He's a good fellow. I can tell you that. He'll strike in quickly, too. 
but he's dead and rotten. No, my good lord, I am the very man. I'll see that straight. That from your first of difference and decay have followed your sad steps. You are welcome hither. Nor no man else. All's cheerless, dark and deadly. Thy eldest daughters have verdone themselves, and desperately are dead. Aye, so I think. He knows not what he says, and vain is it that we present us to him. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? Thou'lt come no more, never, 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 never. Do you see this? Look on her. Look, her lips. Look there. Look there. He faints, my lord, my lord. Break, heart, I prithee break. He's dead, indeed. The wonder is, he hath endured so long. He but usurped his life. Bear them from hence. Our present business is general woe. Friend of my soul, you twain, rule in this realm and the Gord State sustain. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne the most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. 